How many of you believe that we serve a good God? He's a good God, and He has great plans for His people. Amen? And His desire is for you to arise and shine. Amen? How many of you know you've got something inside of you that is so effective and so effectual that what the devil loves to do is just to keep you in the dark, and he wants you to constantly remind you of who you are from the past. And what Carol said about two doors was so powerful today. We need to realize that Jesus has put something powerful inside of us. He refers to it as a treasure in earthen vessels. There's something so powerful, but we have to let it out. Amen? I'm so glad, Jerry, you let that light out this morning through that word. Wasn't that word just awesome this morning? That, that was a powerful word. Well, I'm going to take the piano. I haven't played for a long time. And uh, I want to just sing a song. Amen? And uh, some of you may not realize this, but years ago I used to... Not years ago, maybe a long time, some time ago, but... I used to play uh, kind of goes along it's called Jesus never fails amen he's a good God isn't he Can I have a little more monitor up here Could I have a little more piano up in the monitor? Was overwhelmed that you died for me. On Calvary's tree As I just suffer And you shed Your blood So we Can see Jesus never failed, and Jesus he always gives and in the time when I lose my mind I 
He never, never fails. Will you jump with me to Psalms 107? Psalms 107 this morning. I'm on a series on God's compassion. God's compassion. David was a man, the Bible says, who was a man after God's own heart. <clears throat> David was not a faultless man or a blameless man. But David knew how to find help in the time of trouble. And the Bible says that in, in the Scripture here, okay, if I can find my text here. Okay, David, I'm going to need help here because I'm not, it's not, if we could go to our first text here on, Psalms 107 says this, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. Everyone say, He is good. His loving kindness lasts till tomorrow. Forever. Everyone say, forever. His loving kindness lasts. Let the people who have been saved say so. <laughs> The Bible actually says if you're saved, it should be coming out of your mouth. For He has brought them and set them free from the hand of those who hated them and gathered them from the lands, from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south. Some traveled through the desert water, a waste. And they did not find a way to, to a city where they could live. Here's people without direction. 
They were hungry and they were thirsty and their souls became weak within them. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. And he took them out of their suffering and he led them by a straight path to a city where they could live. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and his great works to the children of men. For he fills the thirsty soul and he fills the hungry soul with good things. Amen? With good things. Everyone say good things. God has some good things. Not only good things, he has great things ahead for his people. Amen? You see, one of the things in, in order for us to understand compassion, we need to understand what the love of God is all about this morning. And uh, if I could, uh, is, is David my son here? David, could you help me on this thing? Because it's, it's hung up on the song here. And I can't seem to get it to help me move on. I'm so glad I have a son who helps me here. Praise God. Um, and... Uh, I want us to open up with a word of prayer right now as, as we come into this. Father, we thank you, Lord, first of all, that you're the God of compassion. You're a God of great mercy. You're a God who gives us, Lord, understanding. You give us insight. Lord, you've given us, Lord, also authority over the power of the enemy. And Lord, this morning, I just, I'm just i asking you, Lord, to just overshadow our minds this morning. There are those that have come to the house of the Lord who have real questions and have needs in their life. And we believe. We believe through the spoken word, the word of God, that quickened word, that lives will be changed and transformed by your Spirit. And everyone said, Amen. You know, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, it says this, that he who shows mercy shall obtain mercy. And uh, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Let me give you the definition. I went over this two weeks ago. But let me give you the definition again of compassion. It means to express tender love and to show pity. To yearn from within that moves you to take action by demonstrating care and sympathy to be moved to show mercy. That's, that's what it means, to be moved. Mercy is not mercy until it moves you to action. It moves you to change. It moves you to assist. It moves you where it begins to touch your pocketbook. It moves you to take action. That's, that's what the mercy of God is. David in the Bible was a man of great mercy. And uh, there's a story I wanted to start off with. I heard of a, of a young boy several years ago who happened to live in a place where there were lots of pigeons. How many have ever seen a pigeon? Anyone ever kept a pigeon as a pet? Well, you may not believe this, but some people actually even eat pigeons. But this boy set a trap, and he caught a huge pigeon. And this, he was so proud of this pigeon, and he took that pigeon out of a cage that he took, and he sat on the curb on this street. And while the bird is alive, he started plucking the feathers out of the back of this pigeon. And he was enjoying the fact the bird was, you could tell, was being tormented by this plucking of the feathers out of the back of this pigeon. And he was laughing, and some friends were gathering around as they're torturing this pigeon. All of a sudden, an old man walks by, and he says this, uh, Boys, what are, you, what are you doing with that pigeon? He says, we're, we're plucking the feathers out of this dumb bird. It's a stupid pigeon. You know, pigeons, they 
poop everywhere. They, you know, they're always in the way. They just pigeons, pigeons, pigeons. So, or we're, we're, just plucking the feathers out of this. So the old man says, "What? Well, c- can I have the pigeon?" He says, "No way." The boy says, "No way. I'm not giving you this pigeon." Then the boy started thinking to himself, "I wonder if this." Old man will pay for the pigeon. So the boy says, if you give me a dollar, I'll give you the pigeon. As he's plucking the feathers out of the back of this pigeon. The old man stood there and he said, no. I won't give you. Or no, no, no. He said, I will give you a dollar for the pigeon. And then the boy retracted. He says, well, if you're willing to give a dollar, I bet you'll give two dollars. And the man looked at the young boy as he sees the bird being plucked alive. He says, no, I won't give you two dollars. I will give you five dollars. And the boy was amazed. You'd give us, give me five dollars for this dumb Pigeon? Yes. I will give you five dollars. So the boy said, sure, but let me see the money. Let me see the money. So he pulls out five dollars and he gives the boy five dollars and the boy hands him the pigeon. And as soon as the man takes the pigeon, he lets him go. And the boy says, what did you do that for? Why did you you let the bird go free? And the man said, because he was born to be free. He wasn't born to be tormented and tortured. He says, well, I got my $5. I got my $5 and you got nothing. See, mercy moves us to take action. How many of you know there's a lot of Christians, there's a lot of people today that the devil loves to have his way tormenting them. But Jesus shed his blood to set you free. So that you would no longer be held in the grip of satanic lies of the enemy that holds you bound while he torments you day and night. The blood of Jesus has come to set you free. To release His love in such a way because you are worth it. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're worth it. You're worth it. And you know what? You're not worth it just because there's anything good in us. The Bible says all have sinned and we're all deserving of hell. We all deserve death. But it's the blood of Jesus that gives worth to your life. And it not only gives worth to your life because you're in church. No, it gives life and gives worth to the worst of the worst sinners. You may feel like I'm no greater than a pigeon. And my life is being plucked to death. But Jesus shed His blood because He sees the worth in you. And you may say, well, Pastor Ray, why is it so important for me to understand this? It's because you cannot give what you have not received. You'll never be able to share the love of God. In fact, let me just give you some symptoms. When people tend to be critical, when people tend to be unforgiving, when people tend to keep track of what other people have done to them. Jesus said it one day in the house of Simon when he was at dinner. And remember the woman came in and washed his feet. And Simon said in his thoughts, he says, if Jesus was truly a prophet, he would know what kind of woman this is. Because she was a harlot or a prostitute. 
But she comes in unashamed. She comes in and she breaks this box and she begins to anoint her uh, Jesus' feet behind him with her hair. Can you imagine washing Jesus' feet with her hair and she anoints him? And then Jesus tells a story. He talks about two debtors, one owing a lot and one owing very little. And then Jesus asked the question, who do you think, who do you think would be more grateful and thankful, the one who had a lot of debt or the one who had little debt? And the Pharisees said, well, obviously the man who had the greatest debt would be the, the most grateful and the most thankful. So Jesus is using this illustration to help us to understand the heart of the Father's compassion towards us. And what Jesus was saying is this, to whom little has been forgiven, forgives little. But to those who have been forgiven much, the same loves much. I don't know about you, but when I start thinking about all that Jesus has forgiven me for, I have, God gives you a heart of compassion. He begins to open your eyes and desire. Instead of being judgmental towards the prostitute or the sinner or the drunk or the addict or, or that man or that woman, all of a sudden your heart oozes with compassion because Jesus showed me mercy. When my back was being plucked by the powers of darkness and I had no control, when there was nothing I could do, I couldn't get away from the clutches of the powers of sin, Jesus shed his blood so I could be free. So I could be free. I could no longer victimized, no longer held into the grip of satanic power and addiction and destruction. But he loved me enough and said, I value you. And I'm, here's how valuable, valuable you are because of him. He gave his life and he became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. Do you know you will never walk in that dominion authority and victory and power? You will not walk you will not live in the joy of the Lord until you first learn to receive compassion. You must learn to receive compassion. There's a story back in 2 Samuel. I want you to jump with me to 2 Samuel for a few minutes. 2 Samuel chapter 9. I can't believe I started this story several months ago, didn't even finish it. The Lord reminded me, finish the story, Ray. And I said, Lord, I try to finish, but you continue to interrupt my messages. Have you ever told the Lord that? I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times I've had messages up here. Now, I'm not in an argument with God, but I will say there's been times where the Lord will tell me right when I get up here, you're not preaching the message. But Lord, you said Monday to study this out. You may say, uh, does God change his mind like that? Yeah. You need to read in Luke chapter 2 where Jesus turned the water into wine. Remember when Mary, the mother of Jesus, came to Jesus concerning the lack of wine at the wedding? What did Jesus say to Mary? Woman, my hour has not yet come. In other words, there was the timing that the Father and the Son knew, but for some reason, because of Mary's faith, she literally changed the mind of the Godhead. Literally changed the mind of, of, well, of the timing. So Jesus says, see those six water pots over there? Now how many of you know you don't get wine out of water pots? God will often ask you to do something and sow into something that makes no sense on how or why you should be re put. Uh, Lord, we don't need water in water pots. We need a miracle. 
Sometimes God will challenge your faith to do something that is completely illogical. But all of a sudden, when you begin to pour out what you thought would be water, you begin to experience the new wine of the miracle because of faith. Faith is what transforms. Everyone say transform. But in the life of David here, David being a man, he's at the peak of his, of his reign as king over Israel. And from chapter 1 to chapter 10, 11, David is reigning as a king. David was called a man after God's own heart. But here is one of the most powerful, beautiful pictures of Jesus. It really gives us the Godhead, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit working in unison together in this text. And it says here in chapter uh, 9, 2 Samuel 9, verse 1, and David said, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul, his enemy, that I might show hatred? Revenge. See, usually when a king came into power, one of the things that they normally did, if you study in antiquity, you go back and you study this, you'll find out that when a king would come into power, one of the things he did, if he, if he knew that there were any descendants from the previous king, it was a known fact. You kill them all so that there would be no one that could come back and say, hey, I have the rightful place to the throne. But instead of showing vengeance, and by the way, Saul was the grandfather of the man in this text. Saul chased David for 16 years, tried to kill him. And David says this, Is there anyone from the house of Saul that I might show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Why that Jonathan? Because David and Jonathan had made a covenant between each other. Do you know what the new covenant is all about? The new covenant is not a covenant with us. The covenant, the new covenant is the covenant that the Father made with the Son. Jesus is the one who kept and fulfilled the law. We, as the kingdom of priests, become the beneficiaries of that covenant. It's not because you keep the law, it's because Jesus kept the law. You become the beneficiary of it. And when you begin to realize that, guess what? It changes your nature. It changes because grace works through the compassion, through the love of God. And so David says, is there any, is anyone left of the house of Saul? I believe right now the Holy Spirit's about ready to do some promotion and transformation this morning by the Spirit of God. I believe there's some people here this morning, you've been living like Saul on the run. Saul and all of his descendants were refugees. They were running from uh, the, 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 what, they pre, what they presumed would be terror, terror, being terrorized by David as being king. But instead, they come to find out that David is not the kind of king that most kings are. David searches out his enemies to show kindness. Somebody needed to hear that this morning. Because somebody's really holding on to a lot of anger. A lot of hate. My wife needs to suffer. My children, oh boy, that, uh, I can't wait to get them home. Or my neighbor, oh, oh, that neighbor. That boss. How many of you know kindness goes a lot, lot, a lot farther? And see, I, I believe God is doing a shift. He's, he's shifting some gears here. He's making some transition. And here David, here he's, he's looking for anyone. And there was a, a man... Uh, from the, I'm not going to read it for the sake of time, a man by the name of Ziba who used to be a servant of Saul and he, he, was, he was a steward over the property and of the land of Saul's descendants who David allowed to live at that time. And Ziba steps forth and says, there is a man from the house of Saul, his name is Mephibosheth, but he's not around Israel. He's not around here. He's left the country. In fact, he's actually living in the land across the Jordan where the enemy lives. Do you know that there's some people today 
that feel safer in the world than they do the church. There are people, I've heard people say, you know, and I'd rather go to hell and be with my friends and my drinking buddies down there in hell with a bunch of phony Christians in these churches that all they do is critical and judge you. That's sad. That's sad. David sought to show kindness and had compassion. And here's the thing about compassion. Compassion doesn't just think about being kind. It moved him to search him out. How many here have ever had somebody search you out? Anybody ever knock on your door and say, I just want to know how you're doing. I want to, I want to let you know I'm praying for you. I want you to know that you matter. I want you to know that what you've gone through, we're praying for you. We're standing with you. We're here for you. That's compassion. How many of you know that's what Jesus said? If you've received it, he says we're to show it. By the way, compassion is not just getting my little clique of friends together. Jesus said that's what the publicans and sinners do. There was a time in our old church where Carol and I used to go to, we had a clique of friends. We, we, we developed a clique. There were people that we just liked to hang around with. And nothing wrong with having close friends. Good, be good. But we found out that we just was always around them. All of a sudden, God began to say, Ray, I want you to start looking for other people that are not in your clique. Well, well, well Lord, I, 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 I don't know them. They, they might actually... Uh, drink, smoke, or they might uh, do marijuana, or they might cuss, or they, I mean, I start throwing these excuses, and I, I don't want them to unsanctify my sanctimoniness. And the Lord said, I want you to be led by my Spirit, and I want you to in begin to invite people that you're not comfortable with. And I said, I rebuke that in Jesus' name. That can't be from God. Until I read Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, where Jesus said that if you're a true son of God, you'll love your enemies. You'll pray for them that despitefully use you and abuse you. By the way, do you know that compassion and love does not involve necessarily your feelings and emotions? It involves a choice. I'm going to tell you something. Now, this may sound strange to you. When God asks you to love one another, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to like them. Wow. You mean, how can you love someone and not like them? There's been many people, I'll never forget one time, there was a guy in our old church came in the church, and he was drunk. I mean, really drunk. And the Lord said, Ray, I want you to take him down to Burgerville. Uh, we have these restaurants called Burgerville in Portland, Oregon. By the way, it's a great hamburger place. If you ever go to Portland, <laughs> got to stop at Burgerville. Right, Carol? Burgerville. And this guy comes in, he, he's kind of half drunk and staggering. And, and this is right after this, the Lord began to say, speak to him. He says, take this guy down and give him a hamburger. And my, and my friends came over. Tom Myers and Pat Alexander, some of my old buddies that I used to run around with. And Carol knows some of these guys. Hey, Ray, we're going to go over there and we're going to go to some other restaurant. I said, guys, uh, I'm not going to make it today. Why not? We always hang out, man. I know. And we're, we're going to still hang out. But the Lord wants me to just reach out to somebody. I wasn't trying to blow a whistle and say, I'm more holier than thou. But I went over to this guy and said, uh, can I take you, do uh, you have any place you're going? He says, no, I, I have no place to go. I said, can I just take you down to Burgerville? So I took him down to Burgerville. He says, man, yeah. That guy downed four burgers. And by the way, he is a lot skinnier than me. 
So he, I don't know, if he had four, four burgers. By the way, their burgers are like quarter pound. I'm just going to, and I'm thinking, boy, I hope I got enough money or I'll be on the street. Anyway, because I would tell you, the guy kept going. I said, do would you like another burger? Yeah, I'd like to know. We get, could I have another burger? Yeah, I said, that was after the second burger. And then he's going for three. And then he went for four. By the time he's four, I said, Lord, we may need to multiply the loaves and fishes on this one. Because I was really not knowing where this was going. Plus a milkshake and two orders of fries. By the time he was done, he says, wow, I haven't had a meal for so long. I said, what do you mean? It's been days. I never got his name. I think I did get his name, but I can't remember his name. But he left. I never saw him again. The thing that I feel so bad about is I, I was just there connecting, talk, trying to talk to him. He was just all over the place in conversation. I wish I, I, wish I could tell you I led him to the Lord. I didn't. I did pray for him, and I said, God has a plan. He loves you. He cares about you. But he never came back to the church. i, I got to tell you something. I did get a little irritated with God about that. And I'll tell you why. Because, you know, God, I, I didn't go out with my cliquish friends, and I put some money out, and now the guy's gone. A lot of good that did. I know none of you have ever thought like that before. And you wonder, what good? The Bible says, Paul plants Apollos waters, but it's God who gives the increase. You see, sometimes you may not be the reaper of the harvest. Sometimes we like to sow a seed today and reap it the same day. Sometimes God may have you sow the seed two weeks, three weeks, maybe different churches, different far away down the road, all of a sudden, the guy comes. I, I don't know who that guy was in Bible Temple. Invited me, gave me four burgers at Mick or a Burgerville. But man, I tell you, I, I ran into a, a group of Christians along the way. God's been talking that He cares, He loves me, and He care, cares about man. <clears throat> And, but you know what? In our churches, in our mindset, because we don't see the healing or we, we didn't lead them to Christ, well, I guess evangelism doesn't do any good. That is a lie from hell. We need to recognize and stop being so focused on just harvest thinking. I, I believe in the harvest. God may want you, by the way, I, I read last night, boy, boy, think about this one. I read the first 10 chapters of the book of Ezekiel last night. If you want to be depressed, read the first 10 chapters of Ezekiel. God calls Ezekiel, now I'm, I'm not saying the Bible is depressed, but God calls Ezekiel and tells him, gives him visions, open heavens, amazing things that he's seeing. And then God says, I'm going to send you to the rebellious house of of Israel. And I'm going to tell you to do signs and wonders and you're going to do miracles. And then God adds this at the end. By the way, nobody is going to be converted. But the reason I'm sending you is so that I can tell Israel that I sent a prophet among them and they still wouldn't listen. Anybody for the call of God? How many of you would like to still respond to God's call and God says, oh, by the way, I'm sending it to you people and you're not going to see the fruit. We need to be careful about what we think fruit is. Sometimes God may have you simply sow into someone's life in a compassionate way. You may not reap the harvest or walk through the church. Guess, guess who I am bringing because I led them to the Lord. It was my money and my burgers that brought them to the end of the kingdom. Oh, and of course, I'm humble. I'm humble. I, I, I give all the glory to God. Sometimes God may call you to simply sow to a neighbor who doesn't thank you, who doesn't give a hoot about you, can't even stand you, but he still says, I still want. See, this is what David was. Showing kindness to the house of Saul, a family who was trying to kill him. You know what, as I'm reading this, I'm saying, Lord, I don't know if I'm there yet. I'm just being honest with you. I, I, I don't know if, I, if I'm there yet. 
And then the Lord spoke to me. He says, Ray, the more you keep your eyes on me, the more you'll be able to love the unlovable. It's easy to love your friends. You know why? Because what do our friends do? Oh, they give us holy massages and pat us on the back, tell them how great we are. Man, you're my buddy, man. You're my chum. You're my, you're my this, you're my that, man. Because, uh, you know, you scratch my back, I scratch yours. And, you know, hey, he, he's my friend. Well, what if you had a friend that came up to you and said, you know what? I love you so much. <clears throat> I care about you. But I'm concerned about your spiritual walk. Oh, you're judging. You're judging. Maybe that person is the one who really loves you. Maybe it's that guy, that gal that cares enough about you. And they do it with compassion. They're not saying, well, you're going to hell. But they might come up to you and they say, you know what? I've missed you. I love you. I see God's hand is on you in a mighty way. How are you doing? There's such potential in your life. I want a relationship with you. Yeah, but pastor, you're just overlooking all the sins and all the problems and the faults, aren't you? Aren't you? I, I mean, the, when do we get the truth in there? You're giving us a lot of gushy love here in grace ministry, but when do we get the truth? How about leaving that up to the Holy Spirit? the Holy Spirit that does the convicting. It's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. It leads us. Everyone say lead. So they find Mephibosheth. Ziba says he's, he's in the house of Makar. The house of Makar in Lodabar. Everyone say Lodabar. Today we're leaving Lodabar. Lodabar House, the house of Makar was a very guy, he was a man, a very, very filthy rich, very wealthy man. He was a human and a sex trafficker. If you wanted to lose your identity, if you wanted to get lost, you went to the house of Makar in Lodabar in this chapter. Ziba knew exactly where he was. Mephibosheth, who was the grandson of Saul, who lived with five negative stigmas. Number one, a bad reputation. Count, how many of you know that sometimes your name can have a reputation? Maybe you broke the law. Maybe some things happened in your life you're ashamed of. If you were associated with the house of Saul, there was a reputation. Number two, he was dropped on both feet. He couldn't walk. He was a father, by the way. He actually had a number of children, Mephibosheth, in later chapters that talks about him. But he was broken. On, he was dropped by a nurse running for her life. And she picked the infant up, Mephibosheth. But as she was running, the Bible says in earlier chapters, back in 1 Samuel, it says this, that she was running because the Philistines were coming upon them. And as they were running, she drops the baby. Do you know what, that there's some people here today? You've been dropped by people you trusted in. And you never healed right. And you can't walk right. I'm not talking about naturally. I'm talking about walking by faith. Walking in a place where you're whole and healthy and healed. They were dropped. And it wasn't your fault. But you were dropped. And you were hurt. And you never healed. That was Mephibosheth. Number three, he was full of fear. Lived in fear all of his life because of his reputation and his family background. Number four, he had nothing. He lost everything. Because his family, the Bible says Saul and his descendants, because of Saul's disobedience, would have a generational repercussion. And that was what was happening. A generational repercussion. But aren't you thankful for the blood of Jesus that breaks generational curses? But here David doesn't care 
I don't care if he's got a reputation. I don't care if he's lame on both feet. I don't care if he's full of fear. I don't care if he's in the house of Makar, a slave trader, a sex trafficker, a human trafficker. I want to find that guy. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing today. He's searching you out, and guess what? He's not going to quit. He's not going to give up until he finds you. And you know one of the ways you know that you've been found? Is you're walking in confidence. You're walking with compassion. You're living with a sense of destiny. You know who you are, what you have. You know what you possess. There is an anointing. There is power. There's life in you. There's a vision for your life. You're not living in the past. You're not bringing up the past. You're thinking about the present, the future, and you see your life in a very, very, very large way. You're living large. Everyone say large. Your God is not small. He's big. He's great. And so David finds him. Ziba goes and gets to him. Can you imagine the encounter that Ziba has when he confronts Mephibosheth because he knew where he was hiding? Several hundred miles across the Jordan River in the land of the enemy. He felt more comfortable dwelling among the enemy than his own people because of fear what he thought would happen. When he finds him, I could just imagine the encounter. I wish I could have been a fly on the wall to see that encounter between Ziba and Mephibosheth when Ziba walked in the room and said, Mephibosheth, the king wants to see you. You know what I think Mephibosheth said? Turned to his children, turned to his wife. They found us. It's over. We're done. Because it was the right of kings to kill the descendants of previous kings because of the fear of thinking that they would try to come back and take the throne. I can just imagine Mephibosheth saying, give me a knife so I can fall on it. Cut my throat. Kill me. Do something. I don't want to face David. But Ziba says, wait. Wait. It's not like you think. David wants to show compassion. David wants to show kindness. What? David's not going to destroy you or hurt you or take anything from you. He loves you. He wants a relationship with you. No. No, 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 no. That, 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 that can't be. My, my granddad tried to kill this man. Yeah, but David's not that kind of a king. He's a different king. He's a man after God's own heart. Mephibosheth comes back. He knew he couldn't do anything. Couldn't go anywhere because he couldn't walk. He was lame on both feet. He comes back and we jump down. Notice here. Verse 6. And when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he fell on his face, prostrated himself, and David said, Mephibosheth. I love the fact that David calls him by his name. Mephibosheth, and he answered and said, here is your servant. And David said, do what? Don't be afraid. Now, isn't that just like Jesus? Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. The first thing he's concerned about is I'm going to calm your fears. I'm not here to kill you, destroy you. For I will surely show you What? Kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake, and I will restore to you all. Everyone say all. Didn't say I'm going to restore some. God says I'm going to restore all. Guess what, guys? That means God is a God who restores people when they fall into sin. You which are spiritual, restore in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself. When someone sins against me, what am I supposed to do? Well, I'm just to keep myself away from them. That's not what the Bible teaches. If you're a true believer, you want to restore. Pastor Ray, do you do that all the time? Well, I do my best. You know, you can't, you can't hunt people down to show them kindness, but sometimes they will or won't receive it. But here David has him in his presence. He says, I will restore all the land 
of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table. Notice verse 8. And then he bowed himself. This is Mephibosheth. And he says, what is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I am? And the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given your master's son all that belongs to Saul and to all his house, and therefore your sons and your servants shall work the land for him, Mephibosheth, and you shall bring in the harvest and your master's son that they may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's son, shall eat bread at my table Always. Everyone say always. Notice three things that happen here. First of all, this is what compassion does. Compassion searches out the victim. Compassion searches out and finds them. Connect. Everyone say connect. And I'm not talking Facebook. I'm talking some good face-to-face. -face. I need some connection time with you. Let's get rid of Facebook for a while. I'm so tired of Facebook. I mean, I, yeah, I'm, I put a few postings on them. We need connection. Compassion involves some face-to-face -face connection. Saul said, I want to see him. Calls him by name. And what he does, compassion, the first thing he does is he restores relationship and he restores confidence, and he eliminates all fear out of Mephibosheth's life that he will harm him. Just like that man with the bird, he released him and set him free. You know what? I, I can imagine. <clears throat> Lodabar. Lodabar is a place that you can get comfortable with. You can get comfortable being in Lodabar in the house of Makar. Do you know that there are some people that are comfortable being enslaved in their life? You may say, Pastor, that doesn't make sense. Oh, yes. There are some people that are more comfortable being in slavery to sin than receiving the truth of God's grace that brings them higher. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I've talked to many people. Many people over the years. I'm more comfortable hiding, hiding, hiding because their minds have not been renewed and they haven't seen Jesus. Once you see Jesus, He removes the fear. He removes the lie. Behind fear is a lie that says, if people know only about you, they'll never accept you. That will kill you in the house of Lodabar. The house of Lodabar, by the way, one of the Hebrew meanings of Lodabar means the house of punishment. There's some people that throw self-pity on themselves. I'm so bad. Nobody would love me. I'm such a sick person. I got a sick mind. If only people only knew my own personal habits, if they only knew who I really was, oh, I would be rejected immediately. That's living in the house of Lodabar. You need to take control and you need to rise up and say, God's blood, Jesus shed his blood. He's delivered me, set, free me, set me free. He has qualified me to be a partaker of the atonement and his redemption. He's clothed my nakedness. I will not allow myself to stay in this darkness any longer. We've got to do a sozo on ourselves. Do you know I do a sozo on myself all the time? You know what I do? Here's part of my sozo. Ray Galligan is a mighty man of God. Some of you may say, well, that's arrogance. No, I'm not saying it. He said it. I want everybody to say this. I am mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds. That's a sozo. You're an amazing woman. You're an amazing man. You've got an amazing marriage. You've got something worth talking about. You've got something worth showing off. Pastor Ray, if they only knew what we were like. Guess what? 
God takes your worst testimony, what Satan meant for evil, turns it upside down, and he gives glory to his name when you begin to embrace the grace of God. So David says, you're going to eat. The second thing he does is he restores the land. That's what compassion does. Compassion's all about restoration. And the last thing is this. David says four times in this chapter, four times, I want you to eat at my table as a king's son. David intended to transform his identity. You're not just the grandson of Saul. You're my son. And you're going to eat as my son at my table. It wasn't just an honor or a privilege. It was intended to transform his destiny. It was intended to change him in such a way where he began to think differently about him. David was saying, listen, I may be king of Israel, but I want you to understand you're a king's son, and God has some great kingly, and he has some royal plans, and he has some promises he wants to fulfill in your life, and you're not going to live in the house of Makar, the place of punishment, without pasture, without family, with human trafficking. You're not going to become subject to bondage, living in the prison of fear all your life. You're not going to be living with this low limited, small-minded thinking any longer. I am bringing you out to bring you in to restore all that was taken and lost, even though the generational curse was upon you. That curse has been broken through the compassion and the mercy and the grace of Jesus. And right now we all stand as new creatures in Christ Jesus. All things have passed away and all things become new. We become ambassadors of reconciliation, ambassadors of restoration. You may say, well, Pastor, I just got so many problems, so many issues. Get over it. Rise up. You're not an addict. You're not a problem. You're a mighty man and a mighty woman of God. Yeah, but I just don't see it. The Bible says we don't walk by sight. We walk by the word. One of the things says, Pastor, I'm doing this all the time. I'm saying, are you renewing your mind with the living word of God? Am I reading? Am I feeding my faith? If I'm not feeding my faith, then what happens? I will allow my thoughts to feed my fear. Then I become subject to bondage and living below God's best in my life. When you are to rise, shine, let your light shine, there's a testimony, there's power, there's revelation, there is victory, there's destiny that God has for us now. You're not, we're not waiting for God to come. He's already inside of you. Praise God. Let's bow our heads, shall we? <clears throat> Compassion. Jesus was moved with compassion with the leper. With the woman of Nain, he was moved with compassion. He broke the loaves, multiplied, and fed 5,000 in a desert because he was moved with compassion because of the multitude. He says, for these are sheep having no shepherd. Jesus is the shepherd of our soul. He's searching us out. He's not going to let you die without hope not going to let you live in a place of isolation, in a place of pain. He's saying it's time to come home. It's time to come, take your seat as a son, as a daughter at the king's table. What Jesus, or what David was saying is Mephibosheth, I want a relationship with you. I don't want you to be isolated from me. The past is under the blood. You're a new man. You're a new woman.
Behold, I make all things new. Jesus said you can't put new wine in old wineskins. My wineskin can be memories, can be thoughts, can be my failures. When Jesus rose from the dead, He raised you. And He raised you in His likeness. And He says, I predestined you I've sanctified you. Romans 8.27 says, and He even glorified Himself in you. He's the firstborn among many, brethren. Maybe this morning you may say, you know, Pastor Ray, I've made God so small. Like Mephibosheth, I've been living in fear, isolated. I've not been living up to the full blessing and the potential that God has for me. And I need that transformation. I need to let go of Lodabar. I need to come out of pity. I need to come out of unbelief. I need to come out of fear. I need to rise up to be the woman, the man, that he's invited me to a table to eat bread as a son, as a daughter. No longer an orphan. No longer an outcast. Redeemed restored and renewed. If that's you this morning, I want you to raise your hand. I want to pray with you. I see your hands. There's more hands. You need to go up. Amen. Thank you, Father. Let's all stand to our feet, shall we? Can we stand? <clears throat> I'm not here to embarrass anybody, but if any of you that raised your hand like to be come down, and I want to anoint you I'm going to anoint you with a David anointing. Because God's going to bring you from being a pauper to a king, queen. He's here to anoint you afresh, to change your mind, transform your life so that your destiny, you finish your course with joy. That's you. Come on down. Even right now. Just go, go ahead, come. If our leaders can come with me too. We're going to pray. I really feel this whole message applies to this whole church actually, to tell you the truth. I believe God wants us to come and sit at the king's table. I believe he wants us to begin to enjoy the relationship, enjoy the privileges that he's called us to. He wants to break off some curses. He wants to break, you know what a curse is? A curse is any kind of thought or fear or bondage that you feel you cannot change in your own strength. God wants to break that curse and put faith, living faith in your life. If you have an issue like that, of some form of bondage, you need to be down here right now. Right now. We're going to break it in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you that there's power in the name of Jesus. There's healing in Jesus' name. There's cleansing and forgiveness in the name of Jesus. Lord, there is no promise that you have withheld. There's no problem that has been so great that your grace is not sufficient. You have given us, exceedingly given us, abundantly and above more than we could ever ask or think. Lord, we refuse to allow the past. We refuse to allow small-minded thinking. We refuse to allow the doctors or, or our friends or people or anything, Lord, to hold us or strap us or to hold us in bondage or the spirit of fear to bind us any longer. We break that in Jesus' name. Some of us, and I'm not talking about the people down here, I I just felt the Holy Spirit say, some of you, now I believe in restoration, but I felt like the Lord says, some of you are entangled in relationships that is feeding you information that is keeping you below God's best. Yeah, but pastor, aren't we supposed to love everybody? Yes, You're supposed to love and you're supposed to show mercy to everybody. 
but you need to take the lead in a relationship when someone is steering you the wrong way you need to say stop in Jesus name everyone say stop there's a time and a place I've got a lot of friends uh, I used to have more friends what, that are not that were that are not in the church they don't know the Lord I do not let them gauge the, the intensity or I do not allow them to set the standard in a relationship. As a leader, I love them. I respect and honor those that do not know the Lord. But I will not let them lead and guide my life down a road of destruction. Some of us need to recognize how the enemy works, even through friendships. Well, yeah, the Lord wants us to be a friend of the sinner, but He doesn't want you to follow the sinner. You're to be the influence in that relationship. Some of us need the backbone to say, no, I'm not going there. I'm not going there. You know why? You may say, well, pastor, I'll, I'll lose them as a friend. No, you won't. You'll actually gain their respect. You might lose them as a friend for a while, but they'll come back and say, you know what? I've had, I can't tell you how many times this happened. I've had people tell me, you know, Pastor Ray, I hate you. I hate your guts. You said something that just offended me and hurt me. Then they come back and say, you know what? I need to apologize. Well, what do you mean? Well, you said something. I hated you. And I said, you know what? I'm not your problem. We need to start. Sometimes God sends people into our life. I, am, I love what David said in Psalms. That a true friend, the Bible says, let the righteous smite me. For it is a kindness unto me. David realized the importance of having even the rebuke of a righteous man or woman in their life. I don't want to just gather around people who are yes people to me. I want, I, I want people who love me enough to share truth. That, that's important. Today, we flock to people that scratch our back. Father, we pray right now that you would just continue to open the heavens. Lord, your compassions, they fail not. Lord, I just ask you, Lord, to just send the rain of heaven upon our homes, our marriages, and our young people. Lord, touch our cities. Heal the device, divisiveness in our cities. Heal this nation, Lord. We ask you to continue to go with us throughout this day. Give us strength in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. God bless.